All right. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's event. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to all the schools, the students, the families, and others across Canada who are joining us today and are interested in our oceans and what we can do to protect them. So my name is Joe Grabowski, and I work with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So each month we host anywhere from 30 to 40 to even 50 live events for classrooms to join in and meet scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all over the world. This month, our theme is space exploration. So if you head to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find all kinds of amazing events with astronauts, uh, with engineers and scientists to check out with your classrooms. All right. So this week we celebrate World Space Week and today in partnership with the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, the Canadian Space Agency, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO and Little Inventors, we invite you to meet space agency engineer Taryn Tomlinson who will talk about the multiple ways in which Earth observation satellites can help us monitor and protect our oceans. So I'm gonna give a quick little wave to Taryn here as we continue, but there she is, she is ready to go. Um, all right, so as we continue on getting the event ready, space and oceans may seem distant and not related, but space gives us a vantage point from which to look back at Earth. It helps us better understand the science of our planet and find solutions to protect our environment, including our waters. So today you will learn about how you can take part in an extraordinary challenge called Little Inventors, Mission Protect Our Oceans, where you can come up with an invention idea to solve some of the most pressing problems faced by our oceans. You can get inspiration from what Taryn will present to us today. And when you submit your idea, it could become a real object, a prototype. So that's why we have our friend Catherine joining us today. She's gonna to tell us a little bit more about Little Inventors. Let me bring Catherine in for a moment. Hey Catherine, great to see you joining us today. All right, very cool. So everyone, I hope you'll join me in welcoming our expert today. We are so excited to have Taryn Tomlinson joining us, senior engineer with the Canadian Space Agency. Let's bring her back in the call. Hi Taryn, how you doing? Hey, great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. It's absolutely great to have you joining us live today. Thank you so much for taking some time. You've got a pretty awesome job with the Canadian Space Agency, and you've titled our presentation today, Satellites Protecting Our Oceans. So we're excited to know all about how that works, how satellites can be used to protect our oceans. It would be my pleasure to tell you about that today. So if you want to bring up the slides and tell me when they're being broadcast, I'll take it from here. All right. Well, the slides are on deck. I'm going to disappear for a few moments and let you take over. Oh, Taryn, the slides are up and we're ready to go. Okay, it looks like possibly Taryn's screen has frozen. So sometimes with technology, it doesn't always cooperate on the first go. So we're gonna give a moment and see if either her screen clears up or if she has to re-enter uh, the live event for us. So while we do wait for a moment. You can uh, Oh, there we go. Hey, Taryn. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. I think I had a conflict with my VPN. Okay, well, we got you back now. Uh, so I'm going to let you take over for a bit. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to thank everybody for being out here today and listening for World Space Week. And we are discussing protecting our oceans. And we're going to use satellites. And I'm going to tell you how. Joe, thanks for, for hosting this. And my comms team, Alice, who's listening out there, a shout out. And to all of you who are going to ask me good questions today, I hope. And please listen. Please engage. And here's how we're going to start and this here how you can get started with me. I want you to think of the word satellites and I want you to type either in the chat or write down on a piece of paper the word that comes to mind when you think about satellites. One word when you're thinking about satellites. Go ahead and put them in the chat. Joe's going to say a few of them out loud. And what I'm looking for is whether or not I'm going to change your mind at the end of this Whole presentation which will last about 20 minutes and I want to see if your word changes. 
All right, so I'm gonna pop in for a moment. We've got a few responses starting to come in. I can see some coming in via the YouTube as well as our live classrooms. We've got space, we've got TV, we've got universe. Let me go back to the, oh yeah, lots of space, <laughs> Area 51. <laughs> Yeah, space, Hubble. Yeah, there's another one. Technology, the moon. Um, all right, lots of great stuff. That's great yeah. stuff. I love it. You know, somebody said TV, and of course, most of us think about our phones and we think about connectivity and we think about GPS, and those are all great answers. But today, I want to tell you that satellites do so much more than the technology that you're used to seeing. We can use satellites to protect our planet in ways that you never imagined. And so we're going to begin by watching a video, and that's going to kick it off. So go ahead, Joe, cue up that video. While looking at Earth from space, Canadian Space Agency astronaut David Saint-Jacques was amazed by the beauty of our planet. He called Earth humanity's spacecraft. Earth is keeping billions of people alive and billions of animals and billions of plants alive in the deadly vacuum of space. So we are all astronauts and our main spacecraft is, is Mother Earth. We are responsible to keep Earth in good shape. We can find solutions and when we work together, we can accomplish miracles and things that we thought were impossible. That gives me a lot of hope for the future. Earth imagery from space helps us better understand the science of our planet and find solutions to protect our environment. Wonderful, thank you. That's such a great video. Canada is such a big country and we're bordered by three oceans and we have millions of lakes and rivers. And so with all of that water surrounding us, it's important that we are protecting and monitoring all the time. As we saw in the video, we have a great vantage point from space. We can look down and see the whole vast country. We can look down on the planet. This picture that you're looking at was taken by David Saint-Jacques when he was on space station. I knew it was on space station because up on the top, I can see a little piece of equipment, maybe the end of the Canada arm up on the top of the photo. But they love to take photos of the Earth. And he's living up there and able to monitor our Earth every day. Now, this, the International Space Station is perhaps the, the biggest satellite going around orbiting Earth. But today I'm going to talk to you about all sorts of other little satellites, smaller, with all sorts of incredible powers that are able to monitor and help us 24 hours a day to give us information about our planet. This is the only slide that you'll see where I talk about the satellites themselves. After this, I'm going to show you images of what the satellites see. But let's start talking about some of those satellites that are actually up there. There are thousands. And Canada owns a few of those ourselves. I'm going to talk about the ones just around on the bottom there around the planet to begin with. I'm going to talk about the ones that Canadians own, that you own, that we all participate in. The three over on the left, I like to call them the three little sisters. They were launched last year. They have superpowers. Every one of these satellites that you're looking at has superpowers. You can always ask a person who does satellites like me, what's the superpower of your satellite? Well, the three little sisters radar set constellation, they work together, the three of them. And they send out waves that bounce back and they make 3D maps of everything on the planet that you could ask for. They can do it through rain, through clouds. They can do it in the dark. They're incredible for doing it. I call them the three little sisters because Canada has been doing radar satellites for a long time. And the one in the middle that says radar sat two that was launched in 2007 is now 13 years old. I'd love to say, raise your hands. I can't see you all. Who's older than that satellite? Who out there is younger than that satellite? That's a very mature age for a satellite. Not a lot of them are older than that. Canada is really good at radar satellites. We're very good at bouncing these waves off, off the planet and making 3D maps. And I'm gonna to talk to you a lot about that during my presentation. But if there's one thing that I want you to be able to do after this presentation is to say, Canada has amazing radar satellites. We have an older brother who's about 13, his name's RadarSat2. We've got these three younger ones, RadarSat Constellation, the three that work together, and they are doing incredible things for our planet that I'm about to show you. 
SciSat over on the right, a 17 year old satellite, and that's old for a satellite, is still monitoring for climate change every day and contributing to essential climate variables that help us meet our goals with international countries to keep our planet safe. And up along the top, there's five satellites that show us working with international agencies and other countries on their satellites. And we put on little instruments and we make them superpowers. And so just to talk about a few of them, SWAT, which is the second one there, is going to launch in two years. So it's not born yet, we haven't launched it, but when it goes up, it's, um, we've been working with NASA, the French Space Agency and the UK Space Agency and we've put on our own little instrument and that satellite is going to be able to map 90% of all the water on the whole planet, whether that be ocean, lakes, rivers, it's going to be an incredible superpower, that SWAT, and we can't wait till it's launched. There are many others that you see up above CloudSet. It monitors clouds with climate change. And we have SMOS, which is about soil moisture and salinity of water. So, and Terra, the one over on the right, is the biggest superpower of them all, has five instruments on board. And our instrument, the Canadian instrument, is called Moppet, and it's worried about pollution. Um, and it's monitoring for pollution. So I could go on and on about this slide. This is the one chance you get to see those incredible tools that are being used to protect our planet. Now let's look at what the satellites see and how they're doing it. Now, what comes to mind when we talk about climate change? For me, it's sort of an image like this. This wasn't taken by a satellite. This is sort of something that comes into my mind. We all have our part to do to protect our planet. And it's very, very important that we are looking as closely as we can at the environment that's changing. But how do we do that? When we're trying to look at places that are difficult to access up north or in the middle of the ocean, how do we monitor the middle of the ocean? Or how do we monitor events such as melting of ice caps or floods? Our satellites can do that. And with them, we can see a big picture of the land. Look at this picture. Look at how much we can see. We can see our entire country. This picture was put together from images from the radar sat satellites that I just talked about. We can get that in 3D. We can get the maps of different heights of anything that you can see all the way down to a meter. So they could get down and, and we could map out your entire school from the outside. So it's incredible what our satellites are doing to help us understand and adapt to climate change or to think about the past, the present, and predict the future. And we'll talk about that as I come up. Canada has been observing space for over 20 years, since before you were born. Canadian satellites and instruments are capable of monitoring change, including climate impacts and coastal erosion. What's coastal erosion? Think about taking your finger around the coastline of Canada, this huge long coastline. Just think about going around that edge and asking yourself, how do I detect if the edge is changing or eroding. Let's look at that. This is an image up close of the Northwest Territories. Coastal erosion is caused by melting of ice and rising sea levels, two effects of climate change. It's very important that we're monitoring our long, long coastline all around Canada because it's so important to our biodiversity and resources that need to protect. It's also important to humans who might build their habitats along these coastlines. And we know it's important to some animals that their ground stays stable and that we monitor that it's not changing drastically for them. Can you think of any animals who need that? I can. I think about polar bears when I think about changing land and how much they need stability of their land for hunting. Data from satellites help us understand how climate change is affecting the North, the Great North. And it also can show how sea ice is moving and how thick that sea ice is. Incredible, right? Our radar sat satellites can tell you how thick the ice is. Monitoring from space provides us to be able to navigate between the ice with boats. And it helps us understand our Arctic ecosystems. And it enables us to be able to navigate the waters 
and to ensure that we can deliver, deliver vital supplies up to isolated communities up north. Did you ever think about how hard it is to get supplies up north? Well, our satellites help do that. I'll talk for a minute about illegal fishing. It is a critically important topic to protecting our oceans today and not one that most of us think about very often. But it is important, so important to keep our oceans healthy, is to keep illegal fishing to prevent it. And our satellites can help. We use satellite data so that coastal authorities can ensure safety and sea monitoring and uh, monitoring commercial shipping and traffic in the water. We need to be able to identify ships that are going through the oceans and detect ones that are doing illegal fishing. And our satellites can see them. They can see them all at once. So they're incredible tools, really. And they help protect the ecosystems of our oceans. And they can tell us where the fish are as well. We can see entire groupings of fish uh, in, with certain technologies, certain superpowers that these satellites have, and what helps us to manage and protect them. And it doesn't stop there. Our satellites help keep our oceans clean. Our radar sat data, our radar sat satellites help detect vessels and with their oil spills. Do you see that oil spill coming off the back? Well, those kinds of pollution events that happen in Canadian waters, we can help. We give the information and organizations can respond quickly and they can contain it and mitigate it and they can reduce the impact and the, and for the health of marine birds and mammals and our ecosystems. And speaking of mammals, there's a very important mammal that our satellites are trying to help to support. And Joe is going to show us a video of how we're trying to protect our whales using satellites. Go ahead, Joe. The endangered North Atlantic right whale is an iconic marine mammal. The Government of Canada continues to take action to help protect North Atlantic right whales and is now turning to space for innovative solutions to better detect, monitor, and predict their movements. Observing Earth from space provides critical information that helps protect our ecosystems and wildlife. Space-based solutions have the potential to help shape a better future for the North Atlantic right whale. Thank you, Joe. Um, can you believe that we don't have the solutions yet? That video tells you we're looking for technologies to do it right. We're trying to develop those right now. And that's where you come in because we need the big inventors of tomorrow to help us figure out how to do that exactly. Whales aren't easy to detect. They come up, we detect them, but then they go back down again. But we're trying to look for where their eating habits are. Where, where are all the... Um, uh, krill, where are all the blooms of krill and things that the whales like to eat? And then we know that they're coming. Sometimes we have to think outside the box. We have to look at where they're going instead of just tracking them. And I want to encourage you to think of ideas that other people haven't thought of that really can help us solve problems that are very important to Canadians. I only have two more stories to tell and then we'll be wrapping up. And I know one of the classes has to leave um, a little early, so let me continue. Hurricanes, this is Hurricane Matthew that hit Haiti back in, I believe it was 2016. Our satellites are helpful when we have disasters and floods. Tropical storms, hurricanes, they often threaten the safety to an entire community. Around the clock, our satellites such as RadarSat can detect the characteristics of these disasters before they come and even when they hit. And we help to monitor and respond when these happen. We can help coordinate rescue operations and we can determine the extent of that hurricane or flood, how far it got. It's incredible how we work together with boots on the ground. So we're able to give information real time so that the groups can react and organizations can do the best e that they can in the circumstances, even finding roads to places where they can take people to safety. Um, in this one, uh, I, I do want to mention that we contribute to something called the International Charter for Space and Major Disasters, where all the countries come together and they raise a flag when something's gone wrong in their country. 
and all of our satellites point as best they can to that country and give them all the data to help them monitor their disaster. Can you believe how coordinated and how collaborated that is amongst countries? It is so critically important to do that when there are disasters. An example was with Russia uh, just a year ago, there were 20,000 tons of diesel oil that were spilt and everybody helped to, to participate uh, in order to respond to that. My last story is about using satellites to monitor and water quality and assess your water quality. We often call it the color of water because algae blooms, they create a green color, or a blue green algae. And we're able to detect different colors to let uh, the authorities know when the water isn't safe. That is such an important tool for you and for me so that we can go to a beach and swim in water knowing that it's not harmful and that it's clean. So this is, that was the end of my stories and I'm gonna summarize. That is only a glimpse of what satellites can do for our oceans and our waters today. Water is such an important resource and we share satellite data so that we can manage it and protect it. In the future, we'll be able to do even more. If we take that information, all that information coming from thousands of satellites from space, the better that we do of analyzing the data or using artificial intelligence on big data sets and learning from them, we will have powerful computing so that disasters might be predicted before they happen and that we can start to mitigate the consequences of those disasters. We can also create powerful and detailed maps so that we know where our marine species are or so that we can better protect them. That's why it's so important to keep developing creative and innovative ideas like you're going to do in your challenge. We want to find solutions for future generations. And speaking of the future, we need you. We need your interest in space and science and technology to keep working on these different technologies and techniques to improve our lives. If you are interested in satellites and the benefits for our planet, keep asking questions, keep thinking of what you can do to improve life on earth. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll be working with me on an exciting career in the space sector. And finally, go on our website. You can do all sorts of fun activities, whether you're doing the exploring earth on the left, the digital game in the middle using our radar sat satellite uh, images to play a game, or our digital puzzle using that gorgeous image that I showed you earlier. I wanna quickly revisit the one word that you had. Let's put those words up. And as we do that, Joe will tell me what you're thinking and if your mind has changed at all. And next, Catherine is gonna excite you about a challenge that you can participate in. Thank you so much for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions a little later on. All right, Taryn, absolutely fantastic presentation. Let's give our audience a moment now to put up another word, see how um, you know their thoughts may have changed about satellites. So is it the same word you're gonna put up again? Is it a new word after seeing this presentation? Let's wait a few seconds and see if what- If they don't doing. change, that's okay. We had universe, we had Hubble, moon, technology, space. We had good words before. I'm just interested to see if we have any- yeah, we've, got, we've got a few coming in now. We've got safety, observations, ocean, research, um we've got signals let's see what's coming in via youtube I, love it. I know that alice who works for my communications department who's watching right now is going to appreciate that that shift absolutely earth is coming up let's give it another moment pollution monitoring observations yeah so definitely some new words coming in this time great good to hear it and we need all of you to help with that word prediction that i was using earlier super joe thank you all right, excellent. Well, we are going to meet Catherine in just a moment, but before we do that, Taryn, I want to make sure that we can work in a question um, from our group in Halifax, Nova Scotia, because I know that they're, they have to wrap up shortly. So first of all, here they are. How are we doing, Nova Scotia? Oh. <laughs> hey, Halifax. All right, Halifax, we've got a question for Taryn. Oh. Uh, oh. I don't know. Oh. Oh, wait, are we, are we how, about, how long does it, get it take you to get a job in the Canadian Space Agency? Nice question. Oh, yeah, I can, I'd be happy to rest on to that one. Joe, can I take that one? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, yeah, maybe even a Mr. Mike show for me. So I was a kid about your age on Vancouver Island, and I just love space. I love stars. I used to look at them in the sky, and I used to detect satellites before there were very many up there. There are thousands of them now. And I used to look at them, and I said, how can I find a job that I can do space? And at the time, we had a new astronaut named Julie Payette. And I thought, maybe I'll do what she did. And I swear, I looked at what Julie Payette did, and I did the same thing. I went to McGill. I did electrical engineering. And believe it or not, that led me down my space career to this day. And it's as simple as that. I found a great role model. I said, I want to be just like her. And I studied the same things that she did. And it turned out um, I followed my passion. I never gave up on it. There's my answer, Joe. All right, very cool. I think that's an absolutely great answer. I think having good role models, uh, you know, is a great way to get into exciting STEM careers. Very cool. All right, well, Taryn, we're gonna bring you back in shortly for a little Q&A action. But now I want to introduce uh, Catherine Mangodon, who's gonna join us. Catherine is the chief editor, or sorry, chief educator with Little Inventors and uh, has been working hard to implement the Oceans Challenge in Canada. So let's bring Catherine into the call here. Catherine, if you want to go ahead and unmute for me, great to see you joining us. Oh, yes, the old unmuting trick. There we go. There Thank we go. Time. So I know you've been collecting amazing ideas from all across Canada. So I think it would be awesome if you could uh, share some of those ideas with us and maybe, you know, invite kids and youth who are tuning in now uh, to become part of the solution to us having our healthier oceans. Absolutely. And um, first of all, I wanted to say just absolutely fantastic to, to be here with the Canadian Space Agency. Um, we were super lucky last year, we're, we're last challenge, we did a challenge with the Canadian Space Agency, uh, which was all about finding things for space. And um, we got fantastic, like 80,000 children across Canada participated. And we ended up making 30 objects. And two of the winners I had their ideas traveling to the International Space Station. So this is the sort of stuff that can happen when you enter this competition. So that's why we're really excited to, to bring this to you. And it was brilliant, very inspiring to hear all the things that Taryn was saying about um, how satellites can really help in sort of monitoring the environment. Um, and you might wonder about, so the, the oceans basically are, you know, 70% of our planet is covered in oceans. Um, and this is why we're, we're doing this challenge, which is Mission Protect Our Oceans, because it's something that matters to us all. Without the oceans, we there's no life, basically. So um, what we're doing with this challenge, I'm going to show you some of the ideas that we've received uh, already. You have until the 20th of December this year to enter the challenge. And I wanted to make it very, very obvious as well that um, you don't have to be an engineer or, or dream about being a space engineer or an ocean engineer to, to take part in this. It's really about finding good ideas and we know that you guys have them. So let me just sh share with you some of the ideas that we've received so far already. Okay, so just give me a second. These are some of the inventions that were made last year for the space, um, the Inventions for Space Challenge. We had a fantastic uh, space suit that's like a pajama, but made of glass, a suit for pets so that uh, astronauts don't have to be alone without their pets in space, and all sorts of different things like that, which were absolutely wonderful. Um, but these are some of the inventions that we've received uh, this year already. So the oil so SOPA. Is, is something to protect ships from hitting things and spilling oil. So just a very clever way to try to avoid this oil spillage that Taryn was mentioning earlier. Um, and you can see you don't have to have the whole idea. It's just sometimes it's about having these nuggets that people can really in, be inspired by. The engineers um, that work in this field can look at this and go, ah, I hadn't thought of it this way. So I think that's quite an interesting way to look at it. And we've got this other lovely one, the garbage pelican bird. So you can imagine this bird that could fly around and maybe go to places that we can't access and pick up rubbish from as well. So beautiful drawing as well here from Ava, uh, who is 10 in Lake, Lake Egmont. Uh, and here we've got something that I thought was quite interesting as well in when we're talking about satellites, the hover carbon crops. And it's a, it's basically a bias. It's, it's helping you to see from above what's happening with power stations to protect, uh, to, to check the, the levels of CO2 and, and to stop the greenhouse gases from eating the, the earth. So proper sort of climate change solution there that was invented by Levi. There's only eight and in the UK, so there you go. 
And the last one I wanted to share with you today is um, fishy tech. And um, Taryn was mentioning the, the issue around overfishing or illegal fishing as well. And this is an app that would help educate people about the dangers of, um, of doing that. So you could have all the information at your fingertips in an app. So what I wanted to do is also share with you the, uh, the website that we, you can find more information about that. Um, a lot of what Taryn talked about is stuff that we cover as well in our resources. We've got a lot of free resources for you. Uh, which talk about climate change, about pollution, about the problem of plastic, for example, but also more generally uh, about why the oceans really matter to us. So uh, go in there and have a look. You can look at it with your teachers. You can look at it at home as well. And everything is free. You can upload your ideas. Feel like Don't feel like you, you only have to upload one. If you have loads of ideas, do it, uh, because we look at every single one of them and we give feedback to everyone. So absolutely, um, you, you stand a good chance of, of being selected if you, if you actually take part. So I hope that you will do that. And I'll stop sharing now. All right, Catherine, so cool. Thank you so much for sharing some of those uh, inventions with us. I like the garbage pelican. I thought that was pretty cool to get into some of those hard to reach areas and monitoring for, for that, that litter in the ocean, very cool. And I think this is so cool for students that you know to have the ability to, to not only make something, but then the possibility that it could be turned into a prototype, that is pretty cool. Exactly, and what we have to remember is that the uh, this, what we're trying to do is get these prototypes ready for the start next year, is the start of the decade of ocean science, which is 10 years to celebrate ocean science. And we're trying to get these objects ready for that. So that would be part of a really, really big scientific event next year. So we really hope that you take part. Excellent. All right. Well, it has come time for a little Q&A action. So I have no doubt that there's lots of questions from the classrooms who are live in camera spots with us uh, for the classrooms that are tuning in via YouTube and Facebook. So those who are tuning in via YouTube and Facebook, um, lots of students. I know it's exciting to say hi to each other in the chat, but let's keep the chat now uh, to questions. We can find them easily and make sure we can get as many in as we can. I want to give a few shout outs to groups who have introduced themselves. So uh, all across Canada, we've got Paris, Petawawa, Toronto, St. Catharines, Kenora, and Bolton, all uh, in Ontario. We've got uh, Leduc, uh, Alberta tuning in. We've got Winnipeg, Manitoba, Stonewall in Manitoba as well. Vanderhoff, British Columbia, Arnold's Cove, Newfoundland, Wakefield, Quebec. So it's so great to see so many students joining us from across Canada. Let's bring in our first live classroom here. So Mr. Bruno's class, they're third graders and they're joining us in Ottawa. Let's bring them in. Mr. Bruno, if you wanna go ahead and unmute for me, we'd love to grab a question. There we go. How are we doing, Ottawa? Huh, Mr. Bruno, I'm not sure what changed with your mic. It was coming through really nice for us when you first came in, but we can't hear you right now. Mr. Bruno, do you wanna type that question in the chat? I'm sorry we can't hear it. It sounds like it's gonna be a really good question, but for whatever reason, the mic's just not cooperating with us. We'll give Mr. Bruno a second to get that question typed into the chat for us and we'll give it, we'll get that answered. I'm gonna bring Taryn back in because I have a feeling that some of these questions are gonna be geared towards Taryn and those that amazing satellite systems that we learned about today. So we've got Taryn on deck and ready to go. And then I can see Mr. Bruno is typing his question and getting it ready. While we do wait, I can see a ton of questions are coming in via the chat. A few more groups introducing themselves, more joining us in Winnipeg. And here we go. So Adam wants to know, how do you make uh, the monitors to check the earth? So how are some of these instruments made, Taryn, uh, and then put onto the, the satellite? Oh, that is a really cool, really complex question. Adam, where's Adam, Joe? Uh, Adam's in Ottawa. Cool. I go to Ottawa a lot, Adam. I go north from Montreal to uh, Ottawa. Um, so it's an engineer's dream to build an instrument. Some of these instruments are really small. In fact, I didn't have the time to tell you, but there's CubeSats that go up and there's student groups like yours 
who build CubeSats and NanoSats, and they have them launched into space, sometimes in big groups. And so in order to build one of those, first you have to have an idea. What's the problem I want to solve? It's like Catherine said, sometimes you need to look at the problems a little differently and say, how would I solve this a little different than somebody else? And that makes a novel idea and the one that you might want to test. You might produce a little instrument that'll go on a big satellite, which is your question, or you might even produce a little instrument that goes on its own CubeSat, these little teeny tiny satellites or a NanoSat. And you could go up, send it up, and it could try to solve that one problem. And it might be something simple. You're just trying to detect, let's say, trying to detect a molecule in the atmosphere, in the troposphere, because you want to help fight climate change. And so you're going to help detect that little molecule that shows that the pollution levels are too high or look at the, the ratios of that molecule. You might do something that the different types. You can have a passive um, satellite that's just taking photos like a, like a camera does, or you can have an active satellite like our radar set that sends out waves and bounces it back. Or you can act, have an active satellite that has a little sensor on board that's sensing something like the molecules that are in different, different layers of the atmosphere. There are so many different possibilities Ask yourself the question, what problem do I want to solve? Look at the problem maybe differently than others have. And then you worry about the instrument that responds to solving that problem. And you can get loads of people together. Engineers work in groups. We never solve things alone. We work together. We build things up. And we get ready for space, which is a harsh environment. Sometimes they only last, the satellite might only last a few weeks. Sometimes it'll last years. It depends on what you want to do, a little demonstration or a long operational mission. Everything's possible. You need to try, you need to try things first, do little experiments, and that's what those little tiny CubeSats are all about. I hope that answers Adam's question. It's such a great question for an engineer. I could go on forever. Absolutely. Let me bring them up one more time because we didn't get to hear them. We can at least see them. Let's get a big wave from Mr. Bruno's third graders. There they are. Yeah. All right. Good to see you. Excellent. Okay, well, let's jump to another classroom uh, now. Let's go to Mrs. Lewis's group. There are sixth graders joining us in St. Catharines. Yeah, they are. Hey, St. Catharines. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Hey, Catherine. So, so what are different jobs that you can have when you want to become a space engineer? Can I ask your name? Can I ask your name? Naomi. 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 You can put them back on mute then, Joe. And, and so if I heard that correctly, what are different kinds of jobs that we can have as a an engineer? Was it specific about space? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the truth is I've only been working on satellites for a few years now. I'm actually training robotics. So when I was uh, 15 years old, I heard that Canada was building a robot arm for space. And I heard that Julie Payette was a new uh, a new uh, astronaut. And I thought, that's cool. I want to do robotics. That's actually what I did. And I worked at the Canadian Space Agency for 10 years on putting Dexter, this humanoid robot, up into space. And Dexter launched in 2008. And Dexter is now working day in, day out up on the space station. We have scientists, engineers, and technicians at the space agency. And we have so many of them. We have hundreds of them. And the list could go down, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, every type of engineer you could think of, materials. And uh, then you think of scientists. We have scientists who understand the planetary systems. We have scientists who understand the geology of the moon and of Mars. We have scientists from all sorts of backgrounds who support us. And then we have technologists who help get those instruments ready for space. They're the ones who understand how we'll design these things so that they'll be able to live in the harsh environment. And the newest job, and one of the most important jobs right now, is the data scientists. It's the new thing. We're getting all this information from the satellites, and we need smart people to be thinking about, OK, if we take that information and we join it together with this information, together we might be able to track those whales. We'll need the sensor information from the water with the satellite information from above, put those together. Oh, and also let's put in some drone information and then we can follow those, those whales, for example. I'm just giving you an example, but it's putting together all the data. So data scientists are becoming the most important piece of the new puzzle of solving problems for tomorrow. I hope that gives you an idea that there's, oh, if we wanted to talk about Mars for a minute, we could talk about the future and say, we're gonna need 
farmers on Mars. We're going to need construction crews on Mars. We're going to need people to design animal spacesuits, like Catherine just talked about. There are so many jobs if we're going to talk about colonies of the future, and we're talking about them now. And your generation is going to be the one who has to deliver those colonies on Mars in the future. So you need to think about how to protect this, the people on that planet and understand the whole ecosystem up on Mars. Um, you're going to have to understand water because this whole theme is about water. You will need to understand water and, and the importance of water inside out. Okay. No shortage of exciting careers to explore. Some that don't even exist yet uh, while you're getting ready uh, and taking your courses. Very cool. So I want to give a shout out to Mrs. D'Souza Muzzin's group. Grade sevens joining us in Peterborough, Ontario. I'm going to pop them on camera for just a minute here. There they are. Uh, make them nice and big. Big wave in Peterborough. There they are. Very cool. So their mic's not cooperating, but they're going to send me a question via the chat. So I'm going to keep an eye out for that question uh, via the chat. So we'll give a moment for that to come in. While we do wait, there was a quick question that came in via YouTube. And they're wondering, this is Logan. Logan wants to know, the satellites that we talked about today, are they taking video or is it images that they're taking? Such a good question. Again, his Logan? Yeah. Logan, great, great question. He's a future engineer at heart. There are passive and there are active satellites. Passive ones are sitting there waiting for something to come to them. That's what a camera is. So we call those optical. A passive satellite, an example, is optical. They're sitting there waiting for that information to come and they just snap pictures, sort of like you do with your camera. Active satellites are ones like RadarSat that are sending out waves that are bouncing back and they're actively working at that all the time. So there are different types of technologies. The one that we're building at the moment is called WildfireSat. And WildfireSat has an infrared detector. And if any of you've ever looked at an infrared Im image, it's gonna tell you where the heat is. It's what mosquitoes use to find us. It's looking for the heat and our satellite is gonna be looking for the heat in the, wild, in the forest before they light on fire. It's gonna monitor them as the fire grows and tell the responders that spot is the hottest spot right there. Get over there, it's more important than the one that's making all the smoke. It's actually the spot over here that's causing the trouble. Infrared is also passive, so it's waiting for that information to come. There are so many different types of sensors, and there's probably ones we've never used that we need to think about and consider using. So I love that question, Logan. You, you definitely have an engineer's brain. All right, great question from Logan, very cool. Uh, we've got another class to visit here. This time we're gonna go to uh, our group in Trenton, Ontario, some grade sixes. Let me bring them into the call here. There we go. Mr. Silva and Mrs. McCaw's group, how are we doing today? Give me an unmute on that microphone. Let's see if we've got it working for us. All right. Should be kind of down near the bottom. It's kind of like a microphone with a little flash through it, like a little cross. Ah, there. Oh, we got it. There we go. Okay, Sandra, face over here. Ready? Uh, have you guys ever seen a meteorite pass on all the satellites? Ooh. Good question. What's your name? Uh, Alexander, but I go for Xander. Xander. So. This is a very interesting question. Do we see meteorites approaching our satellites? Now, I told you that we work with all the other space agencies and we work collaboratively in an international group and we try to track, uh, in fact, um, the United States has a directory of every piece out in space that's greater than a couple of centimeters. And so they are tracking any piece of anything, whether that be an old piece of satellite that came off or whether that be a meteorite or any other piece of debris that's out in space, we track them and they're watching them and they're keeping, keeping track. The International Space Station actually has to move from time to time, move up because they see something coming and they see it many weeks in advance and they let, they're doing, the engineers are doing all sorts of what's called orbital calculations and they know that whether they're going to miss or whether they're going to hit and if they're going to hit they ask them to move so most satellites can do what is called a maneuver it's a maneuver a movement in order to get out of a path of something that's large 
but things that are small hit all the time. The Canada arm has a hole in it from something that was smaller than a centimeter, something that we didn't move for. And we're lucky that it didn't damage any of the electronics, but it can happen. And we're always concerned about that. So in order to address that problem, we have an international body who talks about space debris. And space debris is another word for space junk. It's stuff that's floating around out there. We're trying to limit it because as we're getting more and more satellites and we're talking about thousands of satellites now and many thousands more that are coming in the next few years, we need to know when pieces break off or even where everything is. And so we need, in fact, there's, there's engineers and scientists and, and policy people working on tracking that debris. So that's a really, really good question. And thank you so much, Xander from Transom. All right, another great question. Uh, I'm gonna bring Catherine back in here with us as well. Um, and I just wanna start off with a huge thank you to our groups tuning in live uh, via Facebook, via YouTube. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for sending in the great questions. I wanna give a big shout out uh, to our camera classrooms. You guys were awesome. Thank you for the great questions. Um, and you know what? Um, it, it's We're running out of time. I know there's so many more questions, but I wanna thank Catherine, I want to thank uh, Taryn for joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting for the classrooms out there to take part in something like this. So I'm really excited that they have this opportunity. So classrooms out there, don't forget, take part in this Mission Protect Our Oceans Challenge. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun, great feedback. Catherine, thank you for bringing it to us. Uh, and Taryn, thank you so much for taking us into your world, really, orbiting our planet and monitoring the health of Canada. All right. Well, big shout out to everybody for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the partner groups, Canada Space Agency, uh, NSERC, uh, Canadian Commission for UNESCO, uh, Little Inventor. It's so great to have so many groups coming together to put a, such a great presentation together. Classrooms, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your weeks. Enjoy World Space Week. And we're going to sign off for now. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks.